Contrary to what one might first think, the French Omnivore Food Festival doesn't encourage folks to eat just anything and everything, but it does support eating widely and intelligently from the best of what established and emerging young chefs are producing in world cuisine. June 2010 saw two days of classes, demonstrations, and culinary gatherings in Manhattan and Brooklyn. Canapé couldn't keep itself away from the sights, smells, and tastes. The idea is to really to exchange ideas, to exchange feelings, to uh, have uh, two days uh, uh, in common uh, where it's possible to uh, uh, to perhaps build a new image, a new uh, yeah, picture of cuisine in a, in a way. And that's the point of uh, Omnivo New York here in Brooklyn. Cuisine more pure, based on uh, instinct, uh, based on uh, uh, sensitiveness, uh, instead of uh, big rules, you know. Where's the best restaurant in the world? In Paris? Perhaps Tokyo? Possibly New York? No? According to the 2010 San Pellegrino Award, Think Copenhagen, where chef René Redzepi is reinventing Nordic cuisine at his restaurant Noma. Canapé catches him giving a cooking demo at the Invisible Dog in Brooklyn. We will uh, do a scallop dish, we will do a carrot dish, a beet dish, an asparagus dish, a potato dish, an egg dish, a bone marrow dish and a king crab dish. Everybody here is more or less professionals, right? Is there any amateurs? Because then uh, I don't know if you can follow <laughs> follow how, how fast we're going to go. It's a dish that looks very much back in time. We use a, a technique of dried scallops. These thin slices here that are completely crisp, extremely filled with umami is, is scallops. And that's a big part of our region, drying food. This is a five types of grains. There's two grains that I know that you will know, which is uh, barley and spelt. The other one is uh, called kamut and emma and inkhorn. And then wild food. This here is just simply a puree of, uh, of watercress that grows everywhere in rivers and, and streams right now. I marinate them, the grains here. And then what we also have on the dish, those also consist of, of these ones here which looks like pine nuts, but it's actually the nut of beech tree. We also have a sauce of, uh, of squid. This is just ground up squid, whole squid, with the squid sack in it, that, that we then just uh, saute and cook a stock off, and then it turns out like this. It's incredibly delicious. <clears throat> we also have a, this is a, a type of red seaweed called sol, which in English I believe is called dulce. We just soak it in oil and we'll leave it for six months. We mix it so it forms a vinaigrette. And then we start here. We'll start the dressing of it. It's like this. We add the nuts. I think it's, uh, it's incredible that a thin slice of scallop dried at 50 degrees 
for 12 hours can 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 uh, actually get this much flavor. I know that on the plate there's not a lot, but there's so much flavor in it, mm -hmm. and it's so pure all of what's in there. Yep. Then we simply just add the vinaigrette to the plate. It's very interesting. We try it now with all sorts of shellfish drying like this, and it becomes crispy, and it's just natural, full of flavor. Here we go. This is the first dish ready. Portugal is tucked away in a corner of Europe. Its cuisine is hidden in the shadow of neighboring Spain. That may change a bit if George Mendes has his way at his restaurant Aldea, where he is reinventing Iberian cuisine of the 21st century. Here is where his Portuguese family heritage, French training, and Spanish tastes come together. Canapé listened to the master's cooking demo. The first dish I'm going to prepare is um, a shrimp, alinho. Uh, alinho means garlicky in Portuguese. Right now at Aldea, I, I'm really excited about the shrimp that we're getting from Ecuador. I've got some uh, olive oil in a pan. At Aldea, we have a plancha. Everybody knows what a plancha is, right? And these shrimp are naturally uh, salty or seasoned salty from the ocean water. So I just season them with fresh pepper. That's it, no salt at all? No, no, no salt at all. And get that nice little golden caramelization on the outside that adds a nice texture and starts to bring out the natural sweetness and natural uh, qualities of the shrimp itself. So I'm literally cooking them for about 30 seconds on each side. And I'm being really, really careful that I'm using a quick sear and then flipping it over. I have basically olive oil, very finely minced garlic, uh, sauteed in there so the aroma rides, very, very, no color at all. Um, and then we use a, a very uh, delicious sweet smoked paprika or pimenton from Spain. So I, that goes into the pan now. My shrimp are pretty much about 90% cooked right now. And I leave them right about there. After that, we're gonna start going into a stage where they become a little chewy. So maybe a little, you guys can kind of pick up that aroma of garlic. It's very simple, garlic and paprika. So at this stage, I go ahead and add my acidity. I just stick to fresh lemon juice. I think adding anything else is gonna take away from the natural nuances of, of the beautiful Ecuadorian shrimp. Then I add a lot of parsley and a pinch of cilantro. So I go ahead and spoon that garlic paprika oil right onto the plate. Everybody knows that most of the shrimp flavor is in the heads. All I did was take the shrimp heads, caramelize them in olive oil until nice and golden brown. And then uh, added some vegetables, just some onion, some uh, garlic, fennel, deglaze with brandy, deglaze with perno, and then just cover it with water. And then what I get is this really sharp uh, shrimp, pure shrimp head essence. So now I have 100% shrimp on my plate. Every beautiful quality that the product arrived at my door with. And then I, we get this wonderful uh, micro cilantro that actually has the um, coriander seed growing out of it. And there's nothing like having fresh herbs that are still alive in the live state. That gets garnished on top. And then we have this wonderful red bell pepper filaments or paprika filaments. And that goes on top and resembles uh, the antennas of the shrimp. So that's the first dish. Brooklyn is many things, but farm country is not one of them. Don't tell that to Chef Carlo Maracchi at Roberta's restaurant in Bushwick. He has some other ideas, like growing ingredients right on the spot in their backyard. If this sounds more like Vermont than Brooklyn, it just proves Brooklyn has it all. Roberta's was among the great discoveries at the Omnivore Food Festival this year. Canapé goes to Bushwick and talks to one of the best new chefs around. All right, so this is uh, Roberta's in uh, Bushwick, Brooklyn. And if you see up here, these are our hoop houses for growing. That's Gwen, our gardener. Here we have basil, pea shoots over here. These are all peas. The tomato plants are growing over here. 
There's some peas. They're really sweet. It's really good. And if we go over here, you can kind of get a, another shot of, of everything that we have next door. So we're gonna pick some assertion for the scallop dish we're gonna make. Usually like to go with the smaller pieces. Today we're gonna do a scallop dish that uh, we have on the menu here in some variation or another. So these are diver scallops. We also have some steelhead salmon roe, some things that we picked from the garden earlier. These are some uh, radishes, some nasturtium, and a little bit of violet petal. Over here are some purple scallions that we've just grilled off really lightly. So the first thing we're gonna do is season our scallops. Just a little bit of kosher salt. We're not gonna uh, steer this too hard. We just wanna get a nice light layer of color on it. And we just wanna cook it really lightly. So this is exactly what we want, just a little bit of color and just transfer it right here and let it rest. So to assemble the dish, we're gonna start with just a little bit of lemon juice. And here's our nasturtium that we uh, have from the garden. A little bit of olive oil. Radish, we're gonna add a little bit of salt to the black garlic. It's basically a fermented garlic. It's fermented traditionally underground for about 60 days. These are radishes that we grow here. They are very, very sweet, but still have a nice peppery quality to them. We tried some last year, but didn't work out too well, but these just came out fantastic. These are violet petals. We get them out from a farm in Long Island. They have a really nice lavender flavor to them. So this is steelhead salmon roe, uh, wild salmon. Um, and we get it from uh, someone we know in Washington. Um, it just has a great pop. It almost feels like candy in your mouth. And a really nice, clean seafood brininess to it. A little bit of olive oil, and that's it. We always try to basically get a, you know the best ingredients we can find for everything we use. Almost anyone I hire back here is someone that I want to be able to contribute to the menu and help us work out ideas. You know, I don't want it just to be me telling people what I want them to do every day, because um, that gets kind of boring. In 1999, when its members were children, the Cajun band Fufile arrived on the scene to announce that their rich musical tradition would not merely survive in the 21st century, but prosper there. More than a decade and several critically acclaimed CDs later, the young Cajuns continue to balance tradition and innovation with superb musicianship. They tour frequently to help spread recognition of French New World cultures. Myself and Chris Stafford, uh, who's not with me today, but he's flying up right now. Uh, we started the band about 12 years ago. I was uh, 13 and he would have been 10 or 11. A band basically um, comprised of musicians who were in the French Immersion program at home. Cajun music to, to me shouldn't be in any other language but French. That's just what it's always been. And you know, there are a lot of young musicians these days who play Cajun music, but when, when it comes to singing it, they're just imitating sounds. They don't actually know what the song's about, and that's very important. You know, a lot of emotion goes into, into singing those tunes, and how can you do that if you can't understand the words?
the diatonic accordion that we use in Cajun music is a limited scale, so you can't play a lot of things in minor keys on them. So, you know, there, there's definitely a difference between the Cajun fiddle tunes and accordion tunes. We, we like to incorporate that because uh, we have two fiddle players in the band, so we, you know, do a lot of the tunes like me and Cedric were playing today. I actually, I'm apprenticing right now to build violins, so it's just always been something that I'm interested in, and I've actually building the instrument I've gained a lot more appreciation in just what they do. I mean, these really thin pieces of wood that are under a lot of pressure and there's a lot of weight just being put on those things and they're, they're miracles pretty much, you know? Even before amplification, uh, before amplifiers were invented, people would have house parties and uh, let's say before the accordion came along, they would usually just use two violins, maybe some sort of percussive instrument like a triangle. Um, and you know, from that far back, it was just always like a dance based music and uh, social music. Uh, and it's, it's still like that today. Blue Moon is a dance hall in Lafayette, um, downtown Lafayette. Louisiana, yeah, um, and it's it's actually a hostel where you can you know rent a bed there and stay for a night for pretty cheap. If you're ever in Lafayette, Louisiana, go there. It's fun. People think of the Cannes Film Festival in terms of its famous red carpet, not in terms of red ink. But this year, there was an entire film dedicated to red ink, the global financial crisis of 2008 that caused millions of people to lose their jobs, homes, and savings. The documentary Inside Job gives a comprehensive analysis of the meltdown. Canapé catches director Charles Ferguson talking about his film in Cannes, not that far from the red carpet. I have two friends who are in the film who were among the people who warned about the crisis in advance. Uh, Nouriel Roubini, who's a professor at NYU, and Charles Morris, who wrote a book about this um, that was published in early 2008, just one month before the failure of Bear Stearns, actually. I read uh, Charles Morris's book in manuscript before it was published. I read it, this would have been like September, October of 2007, something like that. Uh, the title of the book was The Trillion Dollar Meltdown. And I read the book and then I called Charlie up and I said, you know, Charlie, this is kind of alarmist, you know, trillion dollar meltdown, aren't you kind of exaggerating a little bit? And he kind of smiled and said to me, Charles, wait six months. And boy, was he right. Share prices continued to tumble. Lehman Brothers was forced to declare itself bankrupt. The largest single point drop. The regulators, they had the power to do every case that I made when I was state attorney general. They just didn't want to. We are watching this tsunami coming. They were having massive private gains at public loss. A financial engineer built dreams. When those dreams turn out to be nightmares, other people pay for it. Bear Stearns, Goldman Sachs, Lehman Brothers, they knew what was happening. What do you think about selling securities which your own people think are crap? Does that bother you as a hypothetical? No, this is real. The first time in the late 1980s, several thousand financial executives went to prison for looting the savings and loan industry. When, when the SNL scandal um, erupted in 1987, 1988, many people went to prison for fraud, for insider trading, for embezzlement. 
in the late 1990s, when the second crisis erupted, the late 1990s, early 2000s, maybe, I don't know, perhaps a few dozen people went to prison. The people who ran Enron, for example, the people who ran WorldCom, they went to prison. Uh, a few people who were involved in the dot-com bubble went to prison. This time, nobody has gone to prison. I was delighted that Dominique Strauss-Kahn felt free to talk that openly about this situation. Yes, in, in, in late 2008 and early 2009, even the bankers were terrified. Even the bankers felt, this is so bad, this is so dangerous, that we have to regulate ourselves because this is so extreme that it's even contrary to our personal self-interest and our personal survival is endangered. But then, as Dominique Strauss-Kahn says, the government bailed them out, uh, the moment of danger passed, and they went back to business as usual. What do you think of Wall Street incomes these days? Excessive. By 1986, he was making millions of dollars and thought it was because he was smart. Chuck Prince famously said, we have to dance until the music stops. Actually, music had stopped already when he said that. At some point, I used the word Armageddon. These people are risk takers, they're impulsive. I see a lot of cocaine use, prostitution. So do these guys know that they were doing something dangerous? I think they did. Um, I don't hear confessions. What can we believe in? There's nothing we can trust anymore. We had a whole group of people looking at this for whatever reason. You can't be serious. If you would have looked, you would have found things. It's a Wall Street government. Why do you think there isn't a more systematic investigation being undertaken? Because then you'll find the culprits. I don't believe I have to discuss that with you. You come to us today telling us we're sorry, we won't do it again. Trust us. Well, I have some people in my constituency that actually robbed some of your banks. And they say the same thing. I never heard him mention those things. C could we turn this off for a second?
Pitch your baby bird Are we picking And now we're fed Are we snake Make a knocking call Are we clown And now mother Heather And her dog The light is too faint To see your face But I can feel mm, that you're out of breath.